In this presentation, I want to talk about a rather remarkable development that occurred in Holland in the 17th century, and that was the development of an art market. Up until this point in the history of Western art, all art had been made on commission, which is a system by which a wealthy patron approaches an artist and a contract is drawn up and a deposit of money is paid before the artist begins work on their piece. There were several circumstances in Holland that would present challenges to this system of art patronage. The first is that Holland was a Protestant country and that means that the Catholic Church was not active in Holland. And the Catholic Church had been for hundreds of years the single most important patron of visual art in Europe. Without the Catholic Church, there are no Catholic art commissions. And Protestant churches did not think that religious art was appropriate, and so there was no uh, substitute uh, for that kind of painting being made. This means that you're not going to get paintings like this. In nearby Flanders, today Belgium, we have a Catholic country in which Peter Paul Rubens is still able to make these rather large scale, very large scale, 15 feet tall, this painting, uh, paintings that are of an overt religious nature, uh, the crucifixion of Jesus occurring in this very um, powerful image that uh, is uh, going to be installed in a church, and that's not going to happen in a Protestant country like Holland. Another change that Holland is going to have to deal with is the fact that unlike its neighbors, Holland is a republic. So if we look at this map, we see these uh, large land areas that are that are ruled by monarchies. Uh, in France and Spain and England, and we have the Holy Roman Empire, but there is the small Dutch Republic uh, up in the north central part of this European map. And as a republic, that means that the governing bodies are more democratic. That means that we don't have a powerful, rich monarchy to uh, patronize the arts. Instead, we have a rising middle class, and they are taking power in both economic and governmental structures. So with no royalty, there is no royal art commissions, and you don't get paintings like this. In nearby France, we have this uh, painting of the King of France, and with all of its grandeur and pomp and circumstance. And this is, again, going to be uh, a, uh, a source of um, art patronage that is just not going to be readily available in Holland. Instead, the ruling classes are the middle classes, and these are now the brokers of power, and we get paintings that are really quite different. These very ordinary looking men in their business suits, essentially what we're looking at here in this uh, painting by Rembrandt is a, a board of directors meeting. And we have walked into the conference room and the um, executives are going over the books. And so this is a very different kind of ruling power and a different kind of economic power, and it's gonna produce a different kind of art. These executives and businessmen are getting very wealthy, though, uh, through their extensive trade routes uh, all around the globe. And they are uh, trading in goods from all kinds of exotic localities, and they are getting quite wealthy. So although they may not be royalty and they may be not as rich as a king, they do have quite a bit of money to spend. And so we have a new class of art buyers, middle class merchants and traders that um, are much like middle class people everywhere. They are interested in conspicuous consumption. They're interested in spending their money in ways that other people can see so that other people can see how wealthy they are. And so they begin collecting things. They begin collecting all kinds of exotic things from all over the world. We see trade in, in uh, all kinds of different materials and they, they set up rooms in their houses to show off all of their um, 
interesting collections of rarities and oddities, and also art. So uh, we have middle class buyers and they have a middle class taste. And that's not to be denigrating, but just to say that they what they want to see is they want to see their own lives on display. And I guess that's true for everyone. Uh, but in the past, that meant that royalty and religious subject matter was going to be uh, the subject matter of art. They want to see themselves. They want to see themselves in the artwork that they uh, buy and the artwork that they um, that they patronize. Uh, they also have a great desire for variety. And in a way, one of the ways that you can think about this is just like we sort of want to uh, watch a whole variety of TV and internet programming and we want to see adventure shows, we want to see things that are mysterious, we want to see um, educational programming sometimes, we want to see things that are funny. That same desire for a variety of of imagery to look at was felt by these uh, Dutch middle class art buyers. They wanted to see lots of different kinds of things on their walls. And so one of the things that happens with the uh, art that's being made at this time is that there are these clear delineations of categories of art called genres that begin to form. And uh, some of these are things that we've seen before, but their divisions become more clearly defined. So we have portraits and landscapes and still lives, which all take on uh, particular qualities in the hands of Dutch artists. And we have another category called the genre scene, which is really pretty unique and actually quite charming and something that people really uh, enjoy looking at uh, from the art of this time period. And what a genre scene is, is it's best described as ordinary people doing ordinary things. And so uh, I, I like to think of it a little bit like, you know, a television program uh, that would be like a situation comedy. Just, you know, people going about their business uh, and, and the funny things that they do, not always funny, but always, uh, you know, sort of reminds us of our own lives. And the great things about the genre scenes is that for us to look at them today is we get a great window into the lives of people in the 17th century and the lives of ordinary people, not the lives of the rich and famous, but the lives of the regular folks. So we'll look at all of these individually. Let's take a closer look at these different genres. One of the great portrait painters of this time is Franz Hals. And his portraits are wonderfully uh, engaging uh, and in a way that portraits didn't uh, used to be before this time. So when we look at a Franz Hall's painting, we're encountering a person who is uh, startled and interested to see us, who's reacting to our presence and is very inviting and um, ready to welcome us to the table and to the table usually in a bar because uh, Franz Hals often, you know, shows the uh, the uh, life of good times and having uh, fun with your friends and enjoying yourselves. And don't let the lace collar fool you. This this gentleman here is actually dressed in a fairly normal, casual way for the time period. If we look at uh, Franz Hals' portraits, you know, some of them are more formal, but portraits like these are the ones that really give us a sense of what life was like for people. And we, I, you know, I could see musicians at a local restaurant even today that would look quite a bit like this. In addition to Franz Hals, of course, Rembrandt was primarily a portrait painter. He made his living as a portrait painter uh, and uh, was very successful for a long period. Uh, he also, though, uh, was a master printmaker, which was a great um, democratizing idea that was uh, developed in the Renaissance in, the, the, uh, in Northern Europe, um, because printed imagery was a lot less expensive than a painting, first of all, because it was printed on paper. Uh, and because it was a multiple. That means that the same image could be sold many, many times. And that made the price much lower and it made it more accessible to many more people. So we have um, uh, a, this um, availability of art for people who are of 
not the highest uh, income level. And Rembrandt did a, a great um, many uh, prints and made a good living at that. He also, you can see here, this is a religious uh, image and Rembrandt is one of the few artists who did overtly religious art. And it is a religious art though, he often preferred stories from the Old Testament, which he found to be much more adventurous and um, exciting than, than the stories from the New Testament, as we see here, the blinding of Samson. Also, as a side note, we can take a look at the fact that this painting is quite influenced by Caravaggio, the strong directional light, the um, uh, uh, violent imagery, uh, and uh, the immediacy of the composition are all uh, indications of Caravaggio's influence. As I said, though, uh, Rembrandt made his living primarily as a portrait artist, um, and he is very well known for the many, many self-portraits that he did over the years of his career. Unfortunately, self-portraits are not a great way uh, to make uh, money because uh, aside from your mother, not very many people really want to buy a portrait of you. So uh, the, his self-portraits are wonderful, um, uh, but they didn't really earn him any money. If we turn to landscape, uh, there were many uh, wonderful landscape painters at this time. Jacob Van Roysdale, uh, he very often would, would use these, uh, in, these uh, enormous skies in his paintings. Now, Holland is a very flat country, uh, so maybe that's uh, part of the reason, but uh, Roysdale became known for this kind of treatment of the landscape with these, you know, here he's got perhaps two thirds of the, the canvas given over just to the sky, which is a really striking kind of interesting way to uh, create a landscape view. But note that the painting is actually quite small. That's another factor that I wanted to point out. So this, this painting is about two feet square. And uh, remember that these are paintings that are being purchased by middle-class people with middle-class homes, nice homes, spacious homes, but not palaces and certainly not cathedrals. An interesting thing happens if you walk through a major collection of art, like say the Metropolitan Museum of Art in uh, New York, as you walk through the Baroque galleries of the Italian art, you see lots of very large altarpieces. But when you turn the corner and you go into the Dutch collections, all of a sudden the paintings become much, much smaller. And that's because they are they need to be not only more affordable, but they need to fit in people's houses. So we have a lot more small scale painting going on at this time. And we have specialization even within the genre. So Albert Koip almost always has cows in his paintings. Uh, and it becomes almost a sense of branding that, you know, you want to you want a cow painting, go see Albert Koip and you'll get a nice pastoral scene um, and you'll get some cows and it'd be a very pleasant thing to hang on your wall. If we look at uh, still life, Dutch still life is uh, renowned for the uh, uh, incredible detail and the uh, uh, lush surfaces that are depicted. Now that actually goes right back to Re uh, Renaissance uh, art from Northern Europe, where they've always been interested in reflective surfaces and different kinds of surface quality and the difference between, you know, wood and glass and bone. Um, also, these paintings, very in very much in keeping with that long-standing Northern European tradition, these paintings have a little bit of a hidden message uh, uh, in them as well, which is, you know, that the good things that we enjoy in this life are all transient and temporary. So, in this painting, we have little indicators of um, all of the, the really wonderful, enjoyable things. There's a violin symbolizing music. There's a pen and inkwell that symbolize uh, poetry. And there's also these books that uh, are uh, rev uh, referring to um, literature and poetry as well. Uh, there's a wine glass um, that is uh, re referencing, you know, uh, convivial good times. And in this reflecting sphere, we even see the artist himself painting. So we have painting and poetry and music and all the sort of things that we enjoy in life, but we are haunted 
by the skull in the background that reminds us that these things don't last forever. Um, also in the, in the uh, lower left foreground, there is a newfangled uh, uh, watch that is a, um, an, a reminder of the fact that time is always ticking. Uh, even in the um, middle background, there is a little lit candle that has gone out. All of these things are little reminders of mortality. And this kind of still life is called a vanitas still life because it reminds us that uh, the pursuit of earthly pleasure is a vain pursuit and that eventually mortality uh, visits us and we um, – should be thinking in terms of the afterlife and not only just pursuing the pleasures of today. And that may be seem like a lot to pack into a painting like this, but it's a long-standing tradition that we that we can see from the the Northern European Renaissance of imbuing ordinary objects with symbolic meaning. That's also true of a, of a painting like this. Uh, which is a painting style or a painting subgenre or specialization uh, that's called the absent diner. And we have indicators here of exotic um, trade, uh, the ginger jar coming from China and the citrus fruits coming from much warmer climates than, uh, than Holland. But the disheveled nature of the tablecloth and the, um, the fact that there's no one there enjoying these things uh, is meant to be a subtle uh, indicator that the human who was enjoying these exotic luxuries uh, has succumbed perhaps to death. So they are absent, the absent diner. More specialization within the, uh, within the, the still life uh, genre uh, we see in Rachel Roish, who did almost exclusively floral paintings, and they're gorgeous paintings, just firework displays of blooming flowers, which is kind of interesting when you remember that Holland, one of the things it's known for is trade in flowers, especially tulips. Uh, but there is some lingering morality or uh, or lessons to be learned even from uh, simply a vase full of flowers. Because if you'll notice, all of the flowers here are slightly off the bloom. They are, they bloomed yesterday and they are now beginning to get brown edged on their petals. They are now beginning to get a little um, wilted. And this is a, a way that Rachel Roish has of uh, reminding us that um, beauty fades and that um, that the, there is a um, reminder not to be caught up in our own vanity. Also, she likes to hide little bugs and things crawling around all over the petals just to take what is uh, initially uh, seen as uh, an explosion of kind of beautiful color and then also have this little reminder of these little creeping uh, decay um, aspects. Now to the genre scene. And so this is a, a great ver uh, idea about the, the genre scene, which is ordinary people. We see the, the people of the household here. We see the, the matron of the house who's standing in the, the hallway there. And then uh, out back, we have the maid who has gone into the, uh, the root cellar to collect some uh, vegetables maybe for dinner. And she's got, holding the hand of the little girl of the house who um, is following the maid around at her skirts. And she's having uh, the, the little girl help out. And this is very, it's meant to be sort of heartwarming and um, uh, very typical and sort of give us a smile on our face as we see this. Um, this little interaction take place. Peter de Hoek is really well known for uh, loving these spaces. And if you look, we see this uh, paved bricked uh, patio backyard of this house. And we can see through this passageway, we can see into the street. And then across the street, we see uh, the house on the other side and we can see the windows of that house. And he often will give us these long penetrating views into 
these kind of interior distances. And so, again, that's a kind of a, a branding uh, aspect to Peter de Hoek's paintings. Um, here he is again, and we can see across the tiled uh, floor in the foreground into the next room uh, and out the back door and into the garden and where we see some vegetables growing. And then we see a fence and we can see over the fence and we can maybe make out a house in the far distance. So he's wonderful at giving us these, these uh, nesting spaces that take us back farther and farther. And again, we see the, the maid changing the bed clothes and the little girl has come out, it come back in from playing in the backyard. And it's just kind of an interesting relationship that the, the maid has with the little girl because the maid probably is also supposed to act a bit as a nanny for the children of the household. So we just have ordinary folks doing ordinary things. One of the greatest painters of this type is Jan, Jan Vermeer and Jan Vermeer uh, often gives us solitary figures uh, who are engaged in some sort of activity requiring concentration. Here, uh, the milkmaid is separating the milk from the cream, and so she's pouring the milk off into a bowl, and she has to keep a steady eye on it because she has to note when the milk has been poured out and the cream remains. And so she's looking at it very intently. It's a very simple gesture is a very simple action, something she probably does every day, every morning. But Vermeer's treatment of it gives it uh, this kind of um, uh, hypnotic ritualization, which I think we have all experienced when you get involved in a very, um, a very uh, uh, focused task. Vermeer is also so well known for the treatment of light. In fact, all of his scenes are kind of just an excuse for him to uh, paint these extraordinary uh, images of light streaming in uh, and reflecting off of a variety of surfaces. And we see that certainly in this painting. So again, ordinary person doing ordinary things, but with un in Vermeer's hands, they become uh, these beautiful crystalline images of personal ritual. They can also tell interesting stories. Uh, so this is also Vermeer. And uh, I think this painting is sort of most like uh, this idea of a situation comedy today because it, pe people would be looking at this painting and sort of inventing what's happening. And what you have is you have this young girl who is dressed uh, to indicate that she is a household servant. Uh, she has gone off perhaps to run errands, but she's nipped off into this local tavern having a glass of wine in the middle of the day, maybe something she probably shouldn't be doing. But um, she's sort of uh, taking her chances and hoping no one finds out. But she's approached by this cavalier. And so this is a young soldier. And he's got a, um, you know, this broad brimmed hat and this uh, uniform jacket. Uh, and he is uh, sort of, he's chatting her up basically. And so there's a kind of an interesting way that he, he is, uh, that, that Vermeer is presenting us with something really very contemporary. This, this, um, this girl meeting this charismatic guy who's spinning all kinds of tales. And Vermeer also likes to use the maps in the backgrounds of his paintings, almost like thought bubbles, so that um, we can think of this, uh, this uh, soldier who has maybe come back from traveling to exotic places that this young girl will never have an opportunity. And he's filling her head, if you will, with the, with the stories of these exotic places. And the map behind her is sort of, you can think of it as the thoughts in her head that are as she is lip listening so rapturously to what he has to say. So Jan Vermeer is pretty awesome. And clearly, I uh, think he's great. This is perhaps Jan Vermeer's uh, most wonderful painting, certainly in my view. And uh, this time we have this uh, woman, not a servant, but the woman of the house. We can tell she's dressed very nicely in her ermine trimmed uh, jacket. Uh, but she has closed the shutters and the curtains on the window uh, because she doesn't want people to look in while she's doing this activity. And what she's doing is she's about to assess her value. She's gathered all of her jewels and coins and 
valuable items, and she has a balance in her hands, and she is going to weigh out uh, the worth of her belongings. And in that way, she's assessing her material wealth. But above her head, there is a painting of Jesus judging the afterlife. And so in a way, as she holds the balance and considers judging her material assets and her worth, she is perhaps thinking about another judgment that awaits, uh, which will judge not her material wealth, but her spiritual worth. So it's really quite a beautiful painting, uh, and I think probably one of his very best. In the humor department, no one beats Jan Steen. So Jan Steen uh, loves to give us a room full of people just engaged in all kinds of raucous activity. And if you look past the costumes here, what you see, this is Christmas Eve, uh, the Feast of St. Nicholas, or Christmas morning, I guess, really. And so we see the whole family gathered around together, uh, mom and dad and the kids and grandma, and they're all um, gathered about. And if we look very closely, you know, we can see this little girl in the foreground and she's sort of jealously holding on to her little doll that her mother wants to see, but she's just got it and she doesn't want to let anybody else take a look at it. And she's got a little bucket there full of all other little doodads and playthings. Off to our left, there is this sort of crying bully boy. And if you look really closely, he's, he's being teased by his sister. His sister is holding a shoe, and in the shoe is, a, uh, is just a, a branch, uh, which is just sort of a twig of kindling wood. And that's the uh, equivalent of getting coal in your stocking. And so he's gotten wake, woken up on Christmas morning and they're saying, look, all you got in your shoe was this twig. And so he's very he's crying about it. And I'm sure they're going to give him something later, but maybe he needed to learn a lesson. And people are sort of laughing at him um, having to deal with that um, that humiliation. Over here, we see an older boy pointing up the chimney and he's pointing up the chimney and telling the little uh, the little toddler in his arm, you know, about the story of St. Nicholas. And uh, the younger boy on the ground is also still pretty much in awe of the idea of, um, you know, St. Nicholas coming in through the chimney to leave presents for the boys and girls. So it's very, very much uh, related to our um, our stories of Christmas as well. Of course, if you look at the size of that chimney, you can understand why that was a more plausible idea back in the 17th century of a, of a person coming down the chimney and through your fireplace. But still, it's, it's a, uh, a wonderful image of a family and it's, uh, it, it's um, uh, poignant, but it's also rather funny. And Jan Steen really is known for his humor. He even will send up his own family. Here we hear, we have um, this image called the artist family, and this is his own family, and they're gathered about and they're having a good time. It looks like a, a, a great family to be um, associated with. And there, uh, the old woman is reading a letter, and people are gathered around and they're uh, having fun and they're relaxing and drinking wine and uh, and the uncle is maybe letting the his nephew uh, have a puff on his tobacco pipe which maybe he probably shouldn't do but you know that's how these things go and the family's just having uh, a, a lot of fun and so we can look at Jan Steen's paintings and hopefully see uh, a bit of our own uh, our own reality but just lived out by people who maybe dress a little bit differently. Uh, but they but they didn't act really so differently than we did. And that's one of the great things about the genre scene um, uh, in Dutch still life. But to get back to the main point of this, this uh, presentation, it, it, the point is that at this time, artists began to specialize in uh, different genres and even subgenres of painting. And what they did that was so very different was they would actually paint for the market. They, in, they would create these paintings in anticipation of a sale. 
Before they met with a patron, before any contract was signed, they would paint the painting and take their chances in the marketplace. And that is much more closely related to the way we think of art being made today. And that that uh, concept was invented in Holland in the 17th century of artists um, uh, working uh, freelance to paint the paintings they wanted to paint and take the risk of whether anyone wanted to buy them. And so you could say it gives the artists a lot of freedom because they don't have to simply paint what the uh, their wealthy patrons want, but of course it gives them the the freedom to starve as well. And I'm ending with this portrait of Rembrandt, this wonderful portrait that he did later in life, which is uh, something that we can see here at the National Gallery in Washington, DC. I hope you go see it sometime. Um, but the lesson here is that even someone who had as great a career as Rembrandt eventually fell out of favor and his paintings were no longer desirable and he died penniless. In fact, he died in debt. Uh, and that is the, the harsher lesson of, uh, of, of a system based on a market because the artist does have the freedom to starve to death if they wish. All right, well, that's all for now.